We come now to a time to reflect upon God's word together. Let us begin in prayer. Lord, we can read this word. And by grace, Lord, it's been translated into languages, all kinds of languages. It can be on our devices. It, it can come up on our screens. Lord, it can be spoken in audio files. We can access your word in so many ways. But Lord, it takes more than hearing. It takes more than reading. It takes your spirit speaking and showing us truth in all of this. So Lord, as we reflect upon your word, help us to hear that truth that comes from you, that speaks above the din of worldly agendas and misinterpretations. Lord, guide us unto your truth and your revelation, that on all we say and do, we will glorify and praise you. Lord, this in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When Nobel Prize... Sorry, when receiving his Nobel Prize for Literature, Isaac B. Singer said in his acceptance speech that children don't read to find their identity, to free themselves from guilt or to quench the thirst for rebellion or to get rid of alienation. They have no use for psychology. They detest sociology. They still believe in God. The family, angels... They believe in devils, witches, goblins, logic, clarity, punctuation, and other such obsolete stuff. When a book is boring, they, uh, they don't expect their writer to redeem humanity. But they leave to adults such childish illusions. Lately, our, our family has really begun to rediscover our love of reading. But this has also meant that we have also encountered the human ability to stand in a room in front of a shelf of books and feel like, and even say at times, oh, I got nothing to read. There's nothing to read here. People experience this cognitive dissonance, for example, when they look into a fridge filled with food. You just went grocery shopping that day. The pantry is stocked and, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, but there's nothing to eat here. Or we look into the closets filled with clothes. Oh, I have nothing to wear. Or perhaps we go down to the bakery. Oh, that's the worst one to the donut shop, and look for that low-carb, low-calorie option, and please don't say that you don't, because I may not know better, but God knows better. We've all done these things. We deceive ourselves. It's part of that fallen nature, this fall into deception, that we go about our lives with these circs, these circles of whimsical standpoints that cause us to live a life circling a drain pipe of uncertainty and doubt and self-defeating behavior. And as we approach God's word and reflect upon it together, we should examine indeed how, how are we approaching, are we approaching God's word like we approach that bookshelf, like we approach that refrigerator? Do we open the Bible with an open mind or with preconceived notions and agendas? Do we already think we know what's there or what isn't there? Many people open a Bible looking for a certain passage to say a certain thing, to reinforce a certain idea, to prove a point, to get us to a place, to consume it and then set it aside. The woman in our gospel reading from John today came to the well to, to get what she always got at the well. Water. And there she meets Jesus. And she meets Jesus when she's in a state she doesn't realize how spiritually thirsty she is. But she meets Jesus as she would meet perhaps others at the well. But Jesus is something different. Jesus is a Jew and she is a Samaritan. Now, generally, 
Samaritan and Jews didn't speak to each other, at least not in a social setting in the first century. Their religious ideologies, their political associations, their, their cultural heritage, their assumed differences were enough that it was also culturally acceptable, culturally unacceptable for them to even talk. Once you realize who they are, you just don't talk. And yet Jews and Samaritans preserved persevered in their in the convictions that they were growing f further and further from what God had intended, that the others were growing further. The Jews were getting further and further. The Samaritans were getting further and further away, and that's the way they looked at each other. And we see those same divides in the church today. No matter what denomination you're looking at, or if you're looking at denominations in general, or those that aren't claiming any denomination or will not accept membership. We all point at each other and say, you're getting further and further away from what God intended. But that attitude, that pointing, is truly what is getting further from what God intended. Both peoples were descendants from Abraham, sharing her inheritance of both the land and faith in God. They were both of the, the kingdom, north and south, Jews and the remnants of the north kingdoms of Israel, broken parts of the tribes of Israel, the children of Jacob, and the Jews and the Samaritans both suffered because they were trying to keep, keep doing the same things and get some different results. Jesus asked the woman, give me something to drink. And the woman responds, how can you ask me for something to drink? Jesus is thirsty. That H2O is good stuff, but it only quenches the body a while. Only while the molecules hold, when the, and then the thirst comes again. Jesus knows that he is thirsty, and he knows that he needs a bucket. And by God's will and grace in all things, a woman comes to the well with exactly what Jesus needs. The means of grace and goodness are manifold. What is troubling for us is that we don't have Jesus' insight in all our encounters and situations. The expectation and the foresight in life situations that when you or I come to the well to drink and did not bring a, a bucket and a rope, well, we get nothing out of the experience, except we walk away a little more thirsty. What is more unfortunate, unfortunate, unless someone else comes along who is thirsty and is a little better prepared, we may wait and wait and wait in those moments until we perish of thirst. There are, there's a world of people circling the well of spirituality right now. And they are so thirsty. But everything that they've got, everything they've brought with them, everything that they've equipped themselves with spiritually lacks the means to go deep enough to really get anything. Like the woman at the well, they satisfy themselves on what does not satisfy. You see, the woman may have come to the well ready to get the water out, but she's going through life without the means to live a full life and find meaning and fulfillment in life. See, I'm not just, for her, I'm not talking about water. When Jesus speaks to her, he's asking for a drink, but what he's offering her is much deeper. Her moral compass is off. What she's trying to satisfy her life with is routines. Her relationships are empty and fleeting. She has a spiritual belief in what will happen, that she will somehow be included in because of her ethnicity. How many people feel that they have some access and right to heaven or to faith because Mom and Dad believed. But for her, it's not a real personal concern. Her faith is set someday in the future, sometime in the past. 
in tradition that has lost its real personal meaning to her. But she is trying to believe. She knows her people's history. She acknowledges her desire for the quenching of that thirst. She knows that there's a Messiah. And Jesus meets her at that point. Meets her where she goes for refreshment and never, ever finds it until that day. Where are you finding your refreshment? My family and I just journeyed, experienced, traversed March break. <laughs> University and college students have already had their spring breaks. Many people this time of year are off on trips south or away as weather improves and weather becomes more predictable. All of these journeys, vacations or Sabbaths, sabbaticals, all of these are meant to be times of refreshment and recharge. I don't know. A week in the house as a group with the children Tomorrow might have to be my vacation after vacation to recover from our vacation. Because Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water is going to be thirsty again. The stuff we do in life to make life worthwhile, to make life meaningful, if we find ourselves having to continually come back to it, to be refreshed by it, to be renewed by it, and it disappears quickly, then it's not all that Jesus is offering. Jesus is offering that which satisfied, that which creates a wellspring. And so I challenge you that even in your church experience, if you have to keep, keep the routine in order to be satisfied, you need to dip the bucket a, a little deeper to make the faith a little stronger, to find that deeper refreshment. And it's not some outward thing. Drop the bucket in. For the woman at the well, she was thirsty for a number of things. What are you thirsty for? Hmm? Entertainment? Certain financial status? A, a hold over other, and control over other people? A sense of understanding? Respect? What is it that seems to Quench your thirst for today. For some people, it's the sad things of addictions. We would rather the convenience of quick answers worked out for us, but God calls us to perseverance through our sufferings. We would rather just do what others are doing, but God has made the result of pers perseverance a refinement of our character, our personal character. We would rather live a life without every, with, with everything right there at our fingertips and at our disposal. But God calls us to, to hope and to pray and to strive and to dip into that deep well with everything God provides for us in faith and hope that when we experience love, we can know and feel the refreshment of such that true love offers us. That's not the fleeting, no, the fleeting feeling of our love in its lust and passion forms but love through hope. Even when we are put to shame, the everlasting love of God is poured into our souls that we may draw upon the great wellspring of life that having Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior causes us to enter into resurrection, to really draw us up. The thirsty people of God put Moses in the corner and complained. It is a similar situation I've seen in today's clergy and congregations. Congregations want the clergy to dish the spiritual goods, to sort it all out and deliver it like some consumable good. Just take us to the rock, run the program, take us to the fountain. Go out and evangelize on our behalf. Only it's not me, it's not us, not what clergy are called to do or to be. Moses knows this. Lord, they're even ready to stone me, but I've got nothing left to do in this situation. What are we going to do? The people came to Moses and cried out in a dry and wasted land. 
that they were thirsty. Well, that's what happens when you walk into a desert. And they threatened. And they mocked. Why aren't you exactly what we wanted you to be, Moses? Why aren't you our God? Why don't you have all the answers just right there, the tip of your tongue? And Moses didn't. Aaron didn't. Pastors and clergy and ministers and elders and priests and Sunday school teachers. They don't. None of them are the source of that water. But we support people getting there. We tie on the rope to make sure that people can go dip. We will we'll find the bucket. If you are willing to walk to that stone and trust that the fountain is at that stone, we're going to pray. We're going to pray with you. If you want what God is giving in grace, we provide the, the bucket. We help you haul it up as we test the waters together to make sure that this is a provision, yes, from God. Yes, it is. Not some false tainted stream. Evangelist Billy Graham said, It is contrary to reason for a thirsty person to turn from pure sparkling mountain stream to quench his thirst at a, tail, at a stale, putrid cistern. Yet that's what the human race does when it rejects God's truths and standards in favor of the devil's impure philosophies. These are the deceptions that dehydrate our faith. And they can be boisterous as the mighty evils of the world in a wild chaos of wars and injustice and poverty and famine to the seeming quiet of ignorance, selfishness, ecological destruction, or simply the lie that we can get away with certain things, any things. Or that there's some aspect of our life that God just won't notice, doesn't really care about. None of it's true. Such a deception is the kind of foothold that the devil uses to draw us away from Christ, who is our wellspring. Motivational author and speaker Tim Hansel reminds us that we often put a false barrier between what we call the secular and the sacred, trying to limit the way that God can touch us and express himself through us. And when those barriers come down, it is not just in one part of our life, but in all of our life. The Samaritan woman went back to her, into her village and she told everyone, he told me everything I ever did. God's refreshment for us is grace, forgiveness in the face of not just that sin or that one, but for all that we have ever committed. Forgiveness for all the sins and troubles that come to mind and all those that we're trying to forget and not let people know about. And just when we think we've gone to the bottom of the barrel for those sins, those things that surely God would never, ever forgive. That is, you know, the rock bottom, right? God's love breaks down into that rock to cause a rush of water to flow, of life to flow, of meaning to flow that will refresh us with a love that will never, ever let us go. Amen.